When I was in the Marine Corps, my last role was flight test. I got to apply the latest and greatest advanced technologies to my aircraft and then go fly and fight with those technologies to determine whether or not we were more effective, more survivable, more sustainable. I still do that today. I get to play with the latest and greatest technologies and see if it will help my government clients better accomplish their mission. So for me, that's pretty rewarding. Is I'm always at the leading edge of technology, whether it's for tracking or predictive maintenance or AI at the edge. I get to play with those latest and greatest technologies, and that's fulfilling for me because it's then applied to the mission that my clients are trying to accomplish. Hello and welcome to Coffee with Mr. IoT. My name is Robert Schmidt, Deloitte's Chief Futurist, also known as Mr. IoT. Today on my show we have Chris Bates, Specialist Leader in Deloitte and leading our IoT practice in GPS, what do we call it? GPS is Government and Public Services. So it's not the GPS that tracks no, us. Oh no, no, and it gets confused that way all the time. GPS, IoT, yes, it's, we do tracking, but it's not all satellites. Got it. So, government, public service. Yes. How is this different? Um, why do we have a different part of Deloitte? How do you find it different between government, public service, and uh, privately held companies or public companies, but uh, corporations? Sure. I I think it has a lot to do with our tax dollars. Our tax dollars are being spent by a government to provide services for us, and there is tighter rules around that uh, there's specific regulations that the government must comply with in order to safeguard the use of our tax dollars so those rules and regulations make it sometimes more challenging for the government to use new exciting technologies and put those in place for us but it's also that the government has special processes works differently and so therefore it's necessary for have people like you to yeah. understand how the government works versus me. I'm not as deep in that. I'm better in other things. Is that fair? It, it's very fair. And in fact, one of those things that, that we see all the time is that Silicon Valley and all these tech hubs all over the country, cool things come up. And those innovations are awesome. And we use them every day. In fact, we see it all the time. The tech adoption from us at home is so much faster than the government because of the controls the government has to put around that technology to safeguard it from potential exploitation by our enemies. So one of the things that we do really well as a firm is help connect Silicon Valley to the government and take Bring those together. Yes, yes. There's no reason why we can't leverage those same technologies. What do you think the lag is? Game. What do you think it takes for it? innovation that happens in the private sector until it moves into the public well, sector. A lot of it is to ensure that it's not going to become a vulnerability. Hey, we don't want a security camera to bring down the internet, right? So we also don't want that same security camera or something similar to cause a loss of national secrets and put our deployed sailors, marine soldiers at risk. Right? Do you actually have to have special clearance to work in your role? In certain cases you do. Not all the time. Do you right? have it? Well, you're not supposed to talk about that. <laughs> well, it's, it's actually, even if you have it, you can't tell? <laughs> There's some restrictions for that, yes. Oh, yes. interesting, interesting. I, I have a funny story, and we'll see if we can even keep it in the video. Okay. But you and I did a workshop with uh, one of your clients. Yes. And um, they came to us. We had a really fantastic workshop. I really enjoyed it. Um, it felt actually very similar to working. I mean, the people are similar, with same problems in oh, some yes. ways. Um, but what was funny is we had lunch together, and I don't know if you remember this, but there was a pot standing next to the lunch, and it said donations on there. Yes. And I was really offended, because I thought, how offensive, we asking our clients to donate when we give them lunch? And then I found out that's actually a specific government rule that we have to have certain things around this where they contribute to the lunch rather than us giving them lunch. And I, I, I was really interested sort of like difference in how we work with each other. Well, it is. We, there, we can't give a perception, whether right. it's real or not. Not even a perception. We can't give, right? Right, we that can't give. Yes. Be the same, yeah. and because it has the potential to sway a future contract. 
right? And because it's taxpayer dollars, everybody has to has, have equal access to that money. And if we are doing something that is perceived as influencing in a way that's not equal access, then it's not equal distribution of taxpayer dollars. So let's get out of the mechanics of okay. working with government and let's talk about working with government. Um, you lead the IT practice in the public sector. Um, tell us about some of the really amazing things that you have been doing and that we're doing with it. Sure. Well, we tend to work in two primary areas because every government agency has these. And it's a place where you do work and then also things to get the work done. So that place, let's call it a smart space, because we see places like uh, the natural disasters, the hurricanes, the earthquakes that have hit military bases. Every time those get destroyed, as they do rebuilding, they want to make them smart. They want smart buildings, they want smart bases, they want to bring the things that we get at home every day, you see in your hotel room, right? They want those in their facilities. So those bases, the base commanders, we responsible for rebuilding are asking for our help to put smart into their bases so that's the spaces world but then there's also the fleet world so they have fleets of vehicles and we're seeing this over and over again I especially with the rise of micro mobility and ride share government agencies are having a vehicle per senior person in a dedicated driver that's a old model it just it's not necessary anymore with one government agency, we found that they had 14 vehicles, 14 drivers, 14 senior leaders. We did some analysis for them, got it down to two. Nobody missed a ride. So you apply some IoT to those vehicles, you can really start to look at the usage rates and get to that smart number of vehicles in the fleet. So if you can take it from 14 down to two, you can start to save serious dollars in their fleet operating costs. We're also seeing that they want to ensure that when they turn the key or push the button that it actually starts and then it gets them to accomplish their mission. So we're seeing things like predictive maintenance. They want to forecast when that failure is coming rather than have it break down on the side of the road. How many times have you driven down the road and seen a government vehicle broken there with a pickup hooked up to it, or a, pick, a tow truck hooked up to it. I've seen it a lot recently with some of my clients. Uh, good news, they're replacing that aging fleet, but we're also talking with them about what it, what you can do with a connected fleet so that that truck's not stuck on the side of the road and it can be, it can accomplish its mission. So I gotta believe that when we talk about government, their fleets must be significantly larger than many other fleets. I could start with the easy one, the United States Postal Service, um, huge fleet of vehicles. Very, very few have that size fleet. Do they have the largest fleet in the U.S. or not really? Yeah, the, the largest government fleet, yes. They have over 200,000 vehicles, the U.S. Postal Service. They are one-third of the U.S. government fleet of vehicles. And when I say vehicles, I mean administrative vehicles. So these are the vehicles you'd see on the city streets. I'm not talking tactical. These aren't tanks. They're not airplanes. Well, it's going to go next for that, right? I mean, <laughs> they have very complicated yes. vehicles, too, and those fleets need to be managed as well. They do. Um, and we work with that, too, right? Yes, we do. In fact, there are vehicles that are deploying to the front lines that when it goes on a mission, you want to ensure that it's going to be successful on that mission and not break down while it's in the middle of a mission. And this is a war fighting vehicle same problems that we would see on city streets, but operating in a more ruggedized environment. But they still have the same troubles. I want to make sure that it comes back without breaking down. Because if it breaks down, then I need to send more soldiers and Marines out to go rescue it. So not only have I put those military members' lives at risk while it's broken, I'm adding even more people's lives at risk while they're going to rescue it. I've had a general on the show once, and I almost feel like they laugh at us a little bit, right? Because in a way, they have been doing IoT in their fleet, yes. uh, in the military, army, wherever you go, for quite a while. Um, are you seeing certain technologies that actually, we're talking about innovation, but actually it started there and now it goes somewhere else? I am I served in the Marine Corps before consulting. Oh, you did? And oh, my, 
I was in the Marine Corps for nine years. And oh, I did you. aviation in the Marine Corps. <clears throat> what and was your role? My role was to sit in the back seat of F-18 Hornets as a weapons systems officer. And I tell people, I used to find the bad guy. Right? It was my job to find wherever they were, on the ground, in the air, on the, on the sea. It was my job to find the bad guy. Uh, we used IoT back then to do that because we had sensors on our aircraft. We had sensors on other aircraft. We had sensors off of aircraft. And then we had to bring those signals together to help correlate and determine, was that the bad guy? Is that the bad guy? Where is the bad guy? Now we're using that same concept for tracking technologies, whether it's parts moving through a repair process, vehicles on city streets, or even people in spaces. It's similar technology that I was using 15 years ago in the military. So you were in the Marine Corps for nine years. Yes. Um, you sat in the you, you sat in the back of an F-18. Um, I mean, for people that don't fly F-18, what does that mean? How many are in an F-18? Is there three of you? Well, F-A-18 Hornets and Super Hornets have either one or two people inside of them. So there are certain versions that are just a pilot, and then there are other versions that are a pilot and a weapon systems officer. And I was in that version and had the two. The mission sets are slightly different. I did things like forward air controlling airborne, where I could move around air and ground assets and be some of a mission commander from the back seat of an airplane. I could coordinate rescue of, uh, of folks on the ground. I could coordinate uh, supporting fires when we had troops in contact. So our, our friendly forces are getting shot at. I could bring fires from aircraft or artillery uh, to help save, help protect our folks that were on the ground. And where did where you deployed? Uh, I deployed a, a lot to the uh, to the Asia region, and, and all along in the Asia region, and then a little bit to the Middle East. Do you get to fly too, or do you just sit back there? Well, when you're in the back, I mean, just sit back there. <laughs> Even my sentence is wrong, but let's just leave it at that. Well, it, in what we call a missionized co cockpit. It, it, my aircraft, I had two hand controllers, one on each side, a lot like you would see in the big, the video yeah, games for yeah, the yeah, lighter yeah, aircraft. Yeah, yeah. I had one on each side, and there were often times where I had my hands on each hand controller, upside down, a few hundred feet from the ground, and I'm doing my job focused on what's going on, right? I, I wasn't controlling the aircraft, but I was running a mission from the back seat. Uh, so no, no control from the back seat? No, no flight controls, no flight controls, no. I had to put a lot of faith in my pilot. You ever get used to flying in a thing like this? If you get used to some flying in something, then you die. That's uh, that's complacency kills. So for anybody that's an aviator, I, I, I think they would agree that uh, complacency kills. That you've got to be on your toes in an environment where you're only seconds from death, when your nose is pointed in the right direction, you've got to really be on your toes all the time. I, I could talk about this forever. I just <laughs> thought I have to take a detour into it because it's way too interesting not to. Oh, you love aviation, uh, Mr. I pilot over flying. there. Yes, I do. You know the joke, right? How do you know there's a pilot in the room? No, I don't. They'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to well, start using that. Right? I will start using <laughs> that, absolutely. So, I, I want to take this from... You were in the Marine Corps. You flew in the backseat of a fighter jet. How does that relate to what you do today? Well, I, I mentioned before that I used to find the bad guy, right? I used to find things. And, and it takes a lot to be able to scan the environment, use the right technologies, employ different sensors to ensure that you're going to locate that thing that you're looking for. And now my focus is helping government agencies find those things, it's tracking technologies. So whether it's aircraft coming into a repair process, maintenance, repair, and overhaul is what it's called. You bring the aircraft in, you tear it all the way down, Parts and pieces get shipped off for repair and get lost, get sent to the wrong place. You don't know how long it is. You don't know when it's coming back. You order a new part and then you blame supply and say they don't have enough parts when in fact you're the one that lost it. Putting tracking technology in that repair process so they know where the parts are all the time. So when I was in the Marine Corps, my last role was flight test. I got to apply the latest and greatest advanced technologies to my aircraft and then go fly 
and fight with those technologies to determine whether or not we were more effective, more survivable, more sustainable. I still do that today. I get to play with the latest and greatest technologies and see if it will help my government clients better accomplish their mission. So for me, that's pretty rewarding. Is I'm always at the leading edge of technology, whether it's for tracking or predictive maintenance or AI at the edge. I get to play with those latest and greatest technologies and that's fulfilling for me because it's then applied to the mission that my clients are trying to accomplish. I'm sitting and I'm trying to pick apart in my brain the statement you made before, if you get complacent, you die. And sort of like this thing, you were testing these things and if they didn't work, you died. And now you're doing testing for systems and implementations. And in a way I was thinking, you don't die anymore, yet it still felt so important because you were impacting so many other lives. Help me with this dilemma that's going on in my head. How do you sort that apart? You know what I mean? Well, people ask, do you miss flying? Sure, I do. I look up every time a jet flies over, right? I, I miss flying. But it's my friends that are still there, right? My friends are still out there flying. And by applying the technologies that I'm using today to help them come home safely, that brings me satisfaction, right? Okay, so for you, it's the testing you do now actually indirectly helps them or in some way translates to them. Makes them more capable, right? Makes them more survivable helps bring them home safely. And when you take it out, okay, maybe I'm not putting that technology in a war fighting vehicle today, but I'm putting it in a facility that's repairing a war fighting vehicle so that we keep more of those vehicles at the front lines. If those vehicles are in a hangar getting worked on, they're not out in the fight. If they're in the hangar getting worked on and it's done wrong, my friends are climbing in that and they're putting their lives at risk. So the work I'm doing today, again, it helps brings my brings my friends home alive. So we've talked now a lot about technology that started in the military and that goes into the public space in a way. Tell me about technology that went the other way. Um, I think of really simple tracking of like the the little connectors that we have in our cars that track if the car is running smooth now going back into military vehicles. Give me some technologies, give me some processes, give me some use cases that actually started in the consumer space and made its way the other way. Sure. Well, you think of the OBD2 port. That's exactly. what you're talking about, right? Under the yeah, dash. Yeah. Well, there, there are companies like Geotab that have a device that you can plug in there. And in fact, GSA, the, the uh, big government agency that deals with the vast majority of the government fleet of vehicles, uh, they just awarded a contract to Geotab, put those devices in all the vehicles that they lease out. So everything under GSA control So what does GSA. that mean? These, talk about these devices. Just explain to us a little bit what that means. Sure. Um, well, you plug it into the port. It connects to the CAN bus, which is sensing everything in the vehicle. So this is when I go to the mechanic, what the mechanic yes. plugs in, right? Same thing. The mechanic has a box or probably a tablet now, and they plug the port in. If you go to AutoZone or a, another parts shop, they plug a box in. It tells your codes, right? But now you have it connected all the time. All the time reading the codes and sending that data stream off board. Okay. Right? It's, so what does that do for me? Well, now that that data stream is going off board, it's also got a position. It's got acceleration, braking, it's got uh, engine monitoring and other systems that we care about, real time monitoring. So you're not talking front lines in this case, but that fleet of 600,000 administrative vehicles you're now going to be able to get real-time monitoring of those vehicles so that you can, if an accident happens, you'll know right away. And you can deploy first responders. If you see something about to happen as in a failure in the equipment because you're now getting a predictive maintenance state, you can say, nope, not that one. Take that one back to the shop. Take this one. It's not going to break down. I've heard this really... Um simple example of how many people make uh, their business case with this which is turning the engine off in spare time and how idling costs money it burns gas and if you stop the idling turn the engine off and turn it back on that saves money and that on its own funds the deployment of all these little devices have you heard that i have heard that in fact there's a use case with one government agency where 
they were spending a lot of time idling. And, and the question when it comes to fleet management is how do you measure usage in a way that allows you to set your repair cycle, Yeah. right? Is it based on mileage? Is it based on engine hours or something different? In fact, we see one, one agency that's, that was planning on measuring trips. I said, well, hold on, how many miles? Right? And do you count a trip to the gas station or do you count a trip across the state, right? That's not equal wear. And you're not going to be able to put up a maintenance interval based on that. So we've got to get smart about how we measure usage if we're going to apply it to maintenance. And when you go to predictive maintenance, it allows you to measure the specific thing that's going to fail. The other use for the workaround that one government agency found was they're idling because they wanted air conditioning. So it's hot. So they replaced it with battery powered air conditioning. Right? What, what novel concept? I've reduced engine wear by just doing battery powered. Air well, it's funny because it influenced my behavior. I really, for me, when the engine shuts down, like the automatic shut off, right? right. It always jerks me because like, I feel like the, the car died. Mm -hmm. And so when I'd have a rental car and that was in the car, I'd turn that off. And now that I know it actually really truly saves gas, I stopped doing it. it. It saves gas, saves the environment, right? And especially in a hybrid vehicle, your battery keeps the air conditioner on, right? Yeah, the battery vehicle, that's definitely, the hybrid's definitely different. Right, right. And, and we're starting to see that with government fleets now, is they're doing analysis on, do we go to a complete electric vehicle fleet? Do we go to a hybrid fleet? Uh, we're seeing some procurements that I wish they were considering those options more and they're just still looking at fossil fuels. Uh, but but there's a lot of, there are a lot of options for fleet managers to consider when it comes to replacing aging fleets. and. And most fleet managers are cycling through vehicles every year. There's a certain number that are pulled out of service and put in. And we're encouraged to see that they're looking at electric and hybrid options. So I want to close up with a question looking forward. Okay. Um, you talked about how certain things take longer to get into government agencies. Um, I actually want to just ask you, going looking forward a year or two, what are the things you'd like to bring more forward? What are the things you'd like to work more on with our government agencies? What would that be? Just you, sort of like... Me personally, yeah. right, me personally. I think it really has to do with tracking for me because there's such a stigma right now in that as a government agency say, we're different. We have all these controls and I've been there. I've lived with those controls, I understand them. I also understand the technologies and the vulnerabilities of those technologies. And we're designing solutions now that are hardened so that they're not vulnerable. So they're not vulnerable. Right. So what I want to see is government agencies getting more accepting to hearing about those solutions that are no longer a risk. I'm hearing, hey, we can't use Bluetooth because it's a vulnerability. Well, hold on. If architected correctly, Bluetooth is not a vulnerability. Right? It's locked down and you use it at home every day. And I would argue that so many of these use cases that, that they're concerned about, they're already experiencing without people knowing because people are using their headphones. They've got Bluetooth from their phone to their headphones and their Bluetooth is already running in the background. There's so many good technologies that are out there that aren't being applied right now because folks aren't willing to accept that maybe there are feasible solutions that will keep data secure and not put the government at risk. Do you think there's opportunities for the government lead the private sector because they can do things at scale that no private sector could do? Oh, yes. All the time. There, there are great opportunities for that, whether it's in, uh, in fact, VA, Veterans Affairs and military hospitals are absolutely leading the public sector when it comes to wartime injuries. So if you think about amputees, military health is far and away ahead of the civilian side. So in healthcare and VA, yes. is we can definitely need. Yes, yes, and, and that's just one. There are so many technologies that are mandatory. It's very US too, if you think about it, right? I don't think VAs exist outside the US much, so. It's an interesting idea about right. healthcare and VAs. Right. I think another one of those is sensor fusion. And that's taking signals from multiple different sources yeah. and bringing them into one answer, one common picture. 
data service? Yes. Hey, well, it, it, it gets you to the answer you're looking for, but it, it pulled it in from multiple locations. And I think the military has a, a very strong use case for that and probably the funding to be able to make that happen, maybe much more so than the public, the public sector, the private sector. I love that. Chris, thanks Robert, so much for being on the show. It was thanks a pleasure for having you. And with that, we have come to the end of another coffee with Mr. Bayoti. If you missed any of today's show, any previous shows, please check out our playlist and search on YouTube for Coffee with Mr. Bayoti. Thank you for watching. Bye.